what we need to do is realize that real estate's a regional product, always will be. The problem in property management, I mean, you'd say, one, policy is on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. It's not even state by state. It's city, county, state, federal. The other problem is that we as an industry haven't standardized around things that we could standardize across states and across jurisdictions. It is a people policy standardization problem. And I, I believe until that gets solved, we're going to sort of have a ceiling on how far we can go with technology. And we may actually be closer than a lot of people think to that ceiling already. Welcome to another episode of the Profitable Property Management Podcast. Today, I'm talking to two friends, colleagues, and uh, people I just enjoy talking to. So, Wolf, Peter, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. And where I want to start is about what you guys are up to lately. We've had a relationship through Lead Simple. We've known each other long before that. And now you guys are off to up to starting your own trouble and adventures and <laughs> new stuff. I want to hear about that. I want to hear yeah. a little bit about Crane, the Genesis, and what you guys are up to. Well, I think we really got to know each other because of Lead Simple, actually. Absolutely. Yeah, like we we were sort of ships in the night. Like I knew of you and mm -hmm. maybe vice versa. But yeah, so I think Wolf and I really connected um, and started talking shop and, you know, comparing notes on systems and process and what we're doing with our businesses. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of blossomed into a nice friendship and partnership. We've got some stuff that we're doing between Peter and the Wolf uh, and Crane, and we can get into some of that. But yeah, it's been interesting getting to get to know you, Wolf. Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely, you know, working with the Lead Simple team and interacting. And one day, you know, Peter said, have you ever thought about maybe doing your own thing? I said, it's funny you mention that. I actually ran this thing through ChatGPT, and I'm going to launch this. I called it PM Innovators. I already had the logo design, YouTube channel. <laughs> ChatGPT wrote the description, and Peter was very nice. He, oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. And then the next day, as I've learned, Peter likes think time. So do you think we should get like a graphic design consultant to come up with a logo <laughs> or something? I was like, got it. Okay. And that's where Crane came from was, you know, really – seeing that there is a need in the market for something more than just a Facebook group and that there were people that weren't even, so you're not on social media where you're going to get your questions answered, where you're going to go for peer support, where you're going to, you know, just vibe with people. And so we were determined that we were going to develop something from that. And that's kind of where we are today, trying to, well, not trying, we are connecting property managers that are already up and running and they're just trying to get to that next level. You know, that they're they're wanting to build something more than just, well, got this company and got a couple hundred doors, life's going, but they're they're looking for more. Curation. Mm -hmm. Curation is really important. And it's not always obvious that that's actually worth paying for because there are Facebook groups and there's LinkedIn groups. And I mean, there's got to be at this point hundreds of sad groups with very little engagement yeah. nobody's actually having any kind of connection curation to me is about focusing on interesting conversations finding interesting people and just navigating the conversation in a way that is a function of both your pov and the fact that you guys are, are operators you're in it you're doing it day to day vendors are super interested in kind of managing those conversations but it's like there's a little bit of a subtext of agenda, right? Like ultimately you're trying to get people to use X, Y, Z. Whereas for you guys, this is something you're doing in your spare time where like your main thing mm -hmm. is day-to-day -day boots on the ground. Yeah. You're actually yeah. in it. How do you think that your experience in that regard informs the conversation, the community that you're trying to build? Yeah. So Wolf and I both actively running sizable management companies means that we really it's sort of like one of us, right? Like we know what's needed and wanted within the community of property managers. <clears throat> and I think we were both looking for an opportunity to 
um, like I, I, what I've learned about myself is I love helping other property managers succeed and win. And if I can help them shortcut some of the pain that I went through figuring out stuff the hard way or let them take advantage of a tech stack that I found works particularly well together, I'd love to be able to do that at scale. I mean, you can do that through one-on-one -on -one coaching, but it's, it's, it's not, you know, there's no scale there. It's just very limited. Um, I could never have 35 coaching clients, but we've got 35 members in Crane that are getting most of the same benefits. So that's been really interesting. And we we have been very uh, deliberate about who we let in and how we cultivate the conversations and connections within Crane. I think we had close to 100 applications, right. but we launched with 35 folks. Um, mm. And that was deliberate because we wanted yeah. to make sure that uh, we were careful about making the conversations high quality, um, intelligent, forward thinking. You know, you have to have a hundred doors under management uh, to to get in. So it was we we set it up not for newbies or folks just getting started, but for ex experienced folks who want to take it to the next level. Yeah, and it's not so much about you know if your thing is you want to build a company with an exit plan, great. If you want to build it so you have more freedom of time or whatever it may be, it's not really focused on, okay, we're getting everybody to this revenue point with this profit margin, and then we're gonna teach you how to sell. That, like, that's not the goal, it's, it's, it's really to help people and helping them identify what is it they really want. Because a lot of people, yeah, I wanna get a company, I wanna do this, well, why? What, why? Why do you want that? And then once we help flush that out, now we can start bringing in content, people, connecting people so that they can get to that goal. And that's what we felt was missing. One of the things that was missing in a lot of these established groups was, yeah, you could ask a question and get an answer. So a lot of these Facebook groups were just PM focused Google searches, you know, peer reviewed, throw out a question, let's see what comes back and find the answer that resonates and run with it. Well, now we're connecting people with other people, connecting people with resources and helping them build what they want. Mm -hmm. And that that's where the crane comes from is, you know, what are you building? One of the things that I've experienced in the context of a mastermind is that the interaction is in large part defined by whether or not I'm showing up purely as a consumer mm -hmm. to kind of take a couple of nibbles, a couple of bites, or whether or not I'm really in community and in relationship with other people. And the community piece, some folks resist, as sometimes I resist it, because there are expectations in community. When you have real relationships with people, there are certain expectations that you place, like we're, we're going to talk. If I have a situation, if I have a need, I expect to be able to lean upon you. If I say that we're going to show up and have a meeting, I expect you to be mm -hmm. there. As opposed to the Facebook group, which, I mean, there is a lot of value in, in Facebook groups, in my opinion, but it's it's really different. It's, it's non-committal. It's I show up, I don't. Whenever I want to, I'm there. If I don't want to participate in it for... Months and months, I don't. And the masterminds that I've gotten the most out of is where I've had relationships that have lasted over a period of time long enough for people to get to know me, reflect my thoughts back to me. Like, you said this, mm. and then that happened. Let's talk about the gap. That's useful to me. Right, yeah. That's like real relationship. Where does that intersect with what you guys are, are up to in terms of like the level of relational proximity and community? I think it's something we're still figuring out. I mean, Wolf and I are not community management experts. There's thousands of courses on how to build communities and run masterminds. And, you know, we're just a couple of property managers who have a couple of things we wanted to share and, and some folks we think would like get in and know each other. So, you know, we're playing around with different ideas, like we're doing an in-person meetup at this Na NARPM National Convention that we're at right now. Um, and, you know, I think we're making an effort to bring bring the members to feel comfortable engaging with each other on a more personal level not just like hey what's that zap do but you know where do you live what are you into what about your family because mm. that's what really helps mm. build those connections and then i mean we were already seeing people that didn't realize oh you're in you're in san diego too let's get together let's yeah. grab coffee stuff like that yeah. um that's not something you would see in a facebook group right mm -hmm. there would you wouldn't get to that quite that level of, mm -hmm. of connection. So, yeah, I mean, it's exciting. We, we want this to be for the members. So we're constantly getting feedback from folks. You know, we have a monthly live event where Wolf and I show up and, and we'll talk for a while and have Q&A and 
uh, we're getting feedback from the members on what they would find valuable. So, And I think for us right now, we're in that trust building phase where people are, they're engaging at a base level, but not asking those vulnerable questions yet. And so we, we've had some people like one, and I, I celebrated her because she shared, well, here, here's a, a process template from Lead Simple that we use. And that's huge when you are opening up the door and sharing like, well, this is what we really do in our company and not really knowing how people are going to um, respond to it. And so mm -hmm. when she did that, I was like, that is awesome. And so now more people are starting to share things and step into that vulnerable phase. And once we get that, it's, it's going to be phenomenal. And our role is how do we encourage that and protect that so that people feel that this is a safe place where they can ask questions about vendors, questions about their staff, questions about business, whatever it may be, and know that it's a safe place. And know they're not going to get ripped apart by one of the main characters on Facebook that month or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's something that we we look at during the application process is, yeah. who is this person? What do we know about them? If anything, are they going to be a, um, a net positive? Or, yeah, exactly. And we make them, you know, as basic as signing off on norms that are I think pretty, pretty awesome yeah. and just going from there. So it's really building that sense of community. And when you think of what do you want in a community, you, you want support and sometimes you make deposits, sometimes you make withdrawals. Mm -hmm. Pivoting off of Crane, I also want to talk a little bit about the consulting that you guys have done. Specifically, I want to hear your experience with consulting. I've done consulting. I've done plenty of coaching calls. I've done plenty of free advice calls, paid advice, blah, blah, blah. And I think that there's a lot of takeaways and reflections for me around the the container and the necessary prerequisite for those conversations to feel productive, not is what's coming out of my mouth useful. They can be the judge of that. I'm doing my best. But what are the necessary set of circumstances and parameters for what I'm saying to effectuate change with the person that I am talking to? The reward for me is not compensation. The reward is like seeing change. Like it helped mm -hmm. and made a difference. And I get fairly tired fairly quickly when I'm on the phone with people and it's just obvious to me that this isn't going anywhere. Yeah. My, my Whatever Grinding. the best or worst advice I have is having no impact on the situation. It's a waste of my time. It's demoralizing. How do you guys think about, how do you know when you're on it and how do you, yeah, well, walk me through the con what, what it looks like to actually drive an outcome from advice? Yeah, for me, I've definitely had opportunities to work with people where it was like, this is going, it's not going where it needs to be. You're, you know, you're working with me because you see me as somebody who has either more experience in a certain topic or has been there, done that. So I would assume that that then means when I tell you to do something, you should probably <laughs> do it, right? Because otherwise, go work with somebody that you trust better. I'm not going to be offended. And so when you, you just, after like two or three times, you just see like, yeah, you're not, you're wanting validation that I'm not giving you. So let's just, you know, cut the line and, and you know, move on. Where other people, like there's one person I'm coaching now and the coaching was around implementation, some automation stuff, but now it's just getting into like general business and now what her goals are and where she wants to go and helping her get there and seeing those in, those changes and now that she's speaking at other future conferences and things is to me is very fulfilling because for me it's not about like oh this is an additional revenue source for that it's truly about helping other people get where they want to be in life to me that's like the ultimate paycheck and when somebody I think is not clear on that you you can try to help them flush out where they want to be and what they want to do but ultimately if that can't be defined you, you got to move on because you're just okay we're meeting this week uh you know what do we want to meet about so if, if for me it's about how can i help people get to where they want to be and half of that conversation is them determining well what actually do i want in life hmm. yeah so I, I only do a little bit of coaching um but uh, my reflection, my reflections on it are a few things come to mind. One is, I think the best coaches, which I am not, I have very little experience with it. The best coaches don't tell you what to do. And I think you're experiencing why. Yeah. Because yep. it's just, just 
human nature is someone tells you what to do and you think of reasons to not do it. The best coaches ask questions that lead you down the path. Um, and you end up answering your own question. If you're working with a coach, if you're working with a very high level coach, you're going to suddenly discover the answer that they helped you along the path toward. Um, and that's, that's an art, right? Getting really good at asking questions and helping diagnose, helping your client diagnose their own problem so that when they come up with a solution, it feels authentic to them and they're excited to go implement it rather than just coming from on high. So that's the first thing. The other, the other thing I, I reflect on is that the coaching I've done so far has been very, um, open, open-ended. I don't come in with an agenda or a schedule or a set of KPIs or anything like that. I literally just make myself available for one hour chunks. And I tell, I've been telling my, my coaching customers or clients, you set the agenda. I'm here. I'm making myself available to you. I, I think I'm learning that that's not ideal for them. I think it's difficult as as a as the client in that situation to come up with all the right questions and topics to maximize our time together in some ways i'm starting to think that's my responsibility as the person they're coming to i should have a loose agenda for those coaching calls and have some sort of a path that i'm that i'm starting to walk them down based on what i think they need Mm -hmm. So I'm learning as we go. I, I don't think I'm ever going to make coaching or consulting my main thing, but um, I, I do love doing it. It's awesome helping folks. And I think my final observation is that most of the people I've worked with, they already know what they should do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. They already know. And my role has been just to give them the confidence to go do it. Mm. Yeah. 100% agree. It's, uh, Yeah. They, because the answers, it's not like Peter and I have this extra book of answers that no way else. Oh, you didn't give one? <laughs> hey, maybe it's, in the, maybe it's in the. Right over here. Yes, yeah, it's in the I'll conference copy. pamphlet that they were handing out. Um, the the answers are already out there. People are just looking for somebody to hold their hand and know, like, it's going to be okay to step into that dark at this point of your business. Because either I've been there or I know people have been there. You're going to get through it. This is maybe some of the feelings or anxieties or the issues that may happen on these next steps but this is where you're going to get and that's what people people don't like going into the unknown alone you know so i guess that makes us confidence man that's what we're, <laughs> that's what we're uh we're getting done <laughs> something i was reflecting on earlier today was thinking about talking to operators that are not trying to get to a bajillion doors and are really happy and mm -hmm. satisfied and filled. And I was reflecting on the intersection with that with profits because I do feel like there is an intersection. I don't really see a place for somebody who is at 300 units, working 80 hours, not making any money. I, I don't have a, have a positive view of that. I don't think like that's noble. I think that's unsustainable and it, nobody's winning, including your customers and consumers. If by contrast, you're at that point and you're making money and you find meaning in your work, man, that's amazing. And I think that that person is immune from the Grant Cardone, Instagram, why don't you have a jet yet inside a set of kind of mentality. And that's a rat race. It's, it's usually not yeah. a lot in that. What do you guys think and feel there? Do you feel like the conversation now is, is, is any different than it was in the past in terms of giving per people permission to find contentment as they define it as opposed to needing to chase scale for scale's sake i think it's there uh for, so i'm one of those that's not chasing scale it's it's about for me really the best paycheck is time and being able to mm. do what i want with that yeah making money is important but for me i i want to i want to do things i want to help people i want to I have my hands in lots of different pots and that's what I like. That's what I want. And so designing a business that supports that was my goal. And I think that there absolutely is no badge for grinding for year after year after year and making everybody else money. 
couple of years, yeah, you're going to have to do that. It's just part of either starting up or maybe you bought a franchise or whatever. You're going to have to do that grind. But there's more to that than life. I just, you know, I, I always make the joke that I, the last thing I had one on my tombstone was like, damn, he's got a good move in process. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I, to me, if that's what they, man, his ass were awesome. If that is on my funeral program, I failed miserably. And I think helping people, because they're going back to like, what's right? they don't know what they want. So they see, okay, I guess that's what success is. I have 3,000 doors and we're in 10 states and we're zipping and bopping. If that's your true definition of success, great. But if that's just what you've pulled on yourself because you don't know that there's other options, you have failed too. So I think as soon as you can figure out truly mm -hmm. what is going to make you feel fulfilled, then that's what you go for. Mm. Yeah, that's – it's easy to say and it hard is, to do. I, I honestly oh, think yeah. that def defining – for you, what success looks like is one of the hardest things yes. you can do. Amen. It's almost impossible to tease out the influences and expectations that are external versus what's actually important to you. Yeah, yeah, like what are your values? That's mm -hmm. been a search that I've been on this year is mm -hmm. what, what are my values? Mm -hmm. What's important to me? Not what was important to my parents, not what's important to my business partner, not even what's important to folks that I look up to in the industry mm -hmm. and, and learn from, but what do I care about? Mm -hmm. Do I care about doors? Maybe I do. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Do I care about profit? Do I care about making an impact? Do I care about having fun at conferences? Mm -hmm. And um, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to figure that out. Maybe it's easy for some people. Um, I I've also just started to get really clear on the fact that the, like the, where we are in life in terms of lifestyle getting more doors or even getting more profit is not going to make us any happier it's not going to change my life in any significant way in terms of the satisfaction i feel when i lay my head mm -hmm. on the pillow at the mm -hmm. end of the night i mean i could get five times bigger and i don't think i would be any happier so with that in mind what does that mean for my goals so I don't know the answers here, but it's it's something that as I've, you know, I'm we celebrated 10 years in business earlier this year. Those are what I'm grappling with right now, right? Mm -hmm. And you you hear and you read about, you know, success stories. Like you had a great interview with Ben Sensenbaugh. He had an awesome mm -hmm. exit. Um, and we celebrate those things and we should. And it's natural to think when you when you hear that, like, is that is that for me? Like, do I do I want that? I don't even really know. Um, and I love being able to have these conversations with peers in the industry and think about their perspectives and try and filter that through. Does that speak to my values? Is that, is that what I want? Mm. I've heard the term mimetic desire used to describe wanting or assigning value to something simply because other people assign mm -hmm. value to it. I want it because other people want it. Mm -hmm. You see trends, fads. That seemingly have a basis in science or reality, cold plunge comes to yeah. mind. <laughs> Did everybody read a scientific paper and mutually come to the conclusion that this was what they needed for their medical situation? Yeah. Like, or yeah. is this just like a thing of like people doing something unpleasant, but it's gotta be good for you, but this doesn't feel good, but like surely this must be worthwhile or other people, really intelligent people are doing it. That'd be an example of mimetic desire. And yeah, it's hard not to fall into it. People like me want to be around other people that are doing things of note, significance, import. And it's really easy to conflate the thing that I want to accomplish with the point of being on the journey and in the ride and in the game. I was listening to a Gary Vaynerchuk podcast the other day, and he said something that was really interesting. He notably is in pursuit of buying the the New York New York Jets football team. That's his life's desire. And he posited that he's really happy mm -hmm. and he, he generally finds himself happy. Is it true? I don't know. But he says he's really happy and he wonders if the completion of buying that team may be the beginning of like depression and sadness. Mm. Yep. Finally getting the thing, like putting the fist and the hand around the thing and finally having it, it's like, what 
going to do now. Like the dog who caught the car, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's when you have, if your life desires a physical object, I think that's when you're going to be left disappointed mm. because it's, you could go down that, well, you can't take it with you, but okay, so you got that physical item, now what? You know, there's no infinite game to that. You own the football team. Yeah, it's like the hedonic treadmill, right? Yeah. Like, you get the new car, you feel good for a day, two days, maybe a week. Yeah. And then you're just, oh, yeah, that's my car. Yeah. It's a metaphor. It's yep. like a talisman. If I yep. get this thing, something will happen. But really, there is no thing that's going to provide that. It's yeah. like the way you're showing up in pursuit of something. It's the idea of it that's attractive. I'm getting more and more out of that, guiding and leading the company and thinking a lot about What's the leadership style that's going to allow me to get the most out of this while driving maximal performance? And I'm experiencing more and more that I can't figure out how to deconstruct those things, nor do I want to. On the left-hand side, we have deep care for people. On the right-hand side, we have raw, unadulterated performance with dollar signs behind it. What I'm finding is that integrating those things is the, is the fundamental optimization not picking one, but integrating the two. Mm -hmm. What does your leadership styles look like? What what innovates, yeah, insights, and experiences are you having that are like fresh and raw and real from you guys for figuring out how to lead your companies? Well, I was reflecting on our leadership team recently, and I realized that there's four people on our leadership team, myself, my COO, Kathy, and then Lauren and Tiffany, who both started at our company as administrative assistants. And now they run the company with Kathy and I, which is awesome. And I love, you know, I, I hadn't really like sat and thought about until recently that something positive is happening at our company in terms of leadership development for that to be true. And I, I've considered myself a complete and utter novice in the area of leadership development. And now I think maybe I've earned like one click <laughs> off of novice in reflecting on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think I have a long way to go. And my my leadership style is informed uh, both by my time in Boy Scouts, actually. Yeah. Um, you learn a lot about leading folks, you know, leading boys and, and um, you know, the principles are all the same, right? It's lead by example and don't, you know, my dad always says, don't ask someone to do something okay. you wouldn't do yourself. And um, I also took a lot from my time as a W-2 employee at an engineering firm, a couple different firms, and that informed my own approach to how we handle the team in terms of when I was an employee, what I liked and what I didn't like, I actually took notes on it. I still have it on if I ever owned my own company, this seemed like a crazy fantasy, right? <laughs> that I would own my own company and have people that work for me. You know, this is what I like and this is what I don't like about how I'm being treated as an employee at, at this company. So that's informed my approach as well. Um, but this is very much a journey for me on like leadership, management, what's effective, what feels authentic to me, mm. what actually gets results. Uh, so I, I've i gotten a lot from observing and reading and interacting with other folks who are on that journey too. Yeah, I think it's, you know, there's no shortage of books out there, which I would say the majority of them are more management style opposed to mm -hmm. leadership. Mm -hmm. You really look at the difference between the two. To me, leadership development comes from in the trenches and actually doing and failing and realizing, okay, I should do something different to get different results. For me recently, it's realizing that the best thing I can do is just help them to be leaders, not so much leaders in the company. And if I can help them be leaders in their own sphere mm -hmm. outside of mm -hmm. the office, it's going to benefit the office a lot more because there's fulfillment there. You know, there, there's, you know, you can come with different programs and perks to make your employees happy. But at the end of the day, it's when somebody feels fulfilled, or at least is on the path to getting there, I think that's where they're, they're going to come to work and have more than just their A game because they're, they're finding purpose in life. And it's not just, uh, I got to go to work, get the check, whatever. And so I've, this last two years, that has been kind of my push of how can I help them outside of the office and then the byproduct will be they'll be better at the office mm -hmm. and you know like we have uh, one of our team members in nicaragua he's rotary's not allowed down there 
but he wanted to be in it. So he's kind of starting his own service club down there and they're doing things at two different, one's an orphanage and one is a, a animal um, shelter thing. And he's finding a lot of joy from that. And I can see the difference, mm. you know, at work. We didn't have a class on, okay, everybody, we're going to start, you know, you got to do 10 service hours per year, you know, like some companies will have their red day or whatever it is. We don't have that. It's just, you should want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I just don't want to force people. And so mm -hmm. I think as far as leadership development, we definitely don't have a program, you know, a corporate program on, okay, you're on the leadership track or the management track or anything like that. I just try to, how can I help them find fulfillment? And then the company will reap the rewards. Mm -hmm. I think about the inverted org chart. You ever see one of those where it has the, you know, the frontline folks at the top, it's an inverted pyramid. So down at the bottom is the CEO. And the idea is to illustrate the fact that the frontline folks are the ones actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. And our job is to support them in the execution of that yep. work, in the execution of those tasks. Um, so I think that's the right way to frame it. Like our job is to clear obstacles for them, mm -hmm. help them be productive, mm -hmm develop them personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so that's that's been helpful for me to sort of come back to that metaphor. It's really easy to conflate power with leadership, power as coercion. You will do the thing that I am telling you to do. Yeah. I told you to do it and you did do it. That was my leadership. <laughs> that's <laughs> actually, <you> check. <laughs> that's actually coercion. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the command and control military style. Yeah. yeah. And the, like the thing is, you can't look at that and say it doesn't work on any level. If it didn't work on any level, people wouldn't do it. Question is, does it scale? And the question is, what are we trying to get out of this? If you were trying to extract labor from people and that as far as your ambition goes, like, no, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's effective. At least simple. Our mission is to help people become and achieve more than they thought possible. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that doesn't cut it. It very much does not cut it for me to have a transactional <clears throat> relationship with people. And for me to get relational, it costs me something. It costs me something. It requires me to take a bigger view of the business, of what's possible. It costs me my cynicism, my cynicism that says it's just a job. You know, yeah. it's it's just a business. It's just work. And like if that's how you show up in Orient, obviously it's true, but it could be more. And I spend so much time here, why not it be? Mm -hmm. I'm yes. spending so much of my life here. I also think that command and control style is just ineffective for knowledge work. It just, you can't type faster, right? Like just, it's different than when you're like on an assembly line or something. And uh, yeah, it's, it just, it's not, yeah. I think there's, there is no one style. So like there are, I can think in our company times where command and control may be necessary. Very small. Emergency. Hopefully they never happen. But that is needed. So you do need to know that tool. There's other times where it's, I'm just going to ask questions to help you discover the answer. So I, th I think it's for people that are wanting to develop leadership, it's exposing yourselves to all those different styles and identifying when might I need that? When, when will this be useful? And teaching people to code switch. When do you, when do you go this way to that way? Or, you know, like for us, you talk to an owner one way, you talk to a, ten a tenant a different way. And when is it appropriate? When do when do we do that? And uh, even when I was a school teacher teaching kids, there's playground talk, there's classroom talk. We're using our academic language here. Playground, use whatever language you want, right? So I, I think with, with leadership for me, if there was a, you know, I remember my master's program, one of the things I had to do is develop your leadership philosophy, hated it. Um, but I don't think there's just one philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's knowing when is the right time to do whatever. You know, you look at people that were in defining moments of their life at critical, tragic situations and they either rose to the occasion or they didn't. I think the difference to those that did is whether they had the tools or somebody on their team, they used the right tool at the right time. Mm -hmm. So I think for a company, it's don't just try to, pigeonhole yourself into one style of leadership. I think there's probably a majority of time that you stay in one style, but you need to be able to move around based on what your team needs. Yeah, it makes sense to me that there are certain tools you need to know how to use, even though they should be used very sparingly. Right.
I, I want to ask you guys, what's it been like to be on the inside of Lead Simple? I think like people know informally that we have some kind I definitely don't want to work at a tech company. <laughs> Seeing tech support going 24-7, I was like, yeah, that's not for me. <laughs> so people people know there's like some kind of informal relationship and like yeah. vibing, et cetera. But to put more like context on it, like you guys have pretty unfettered access. Like you're actually like in our Slack, et cetera, which is unusual. It, to me, this isn't the best practice. I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing. We're just we're figuring it out. But it was like vibe, think similarly, boots on the ground. It just made a ton of sense. What's what's the? It, I have I have not had that experience myself at somebody else's company. What's that? Yeah, experience been like. It's certainly novel. Um, being able to see another company from the inside out is fascinating for me because I've I. I only ever ran my company, right? Mm -hmm. So I, and I didn't come from a super entrepreneurial family. Um, my mom did run a small business growing up on a horse farm, but you know, no W2 employees or anything. So it's fascinating to watch the inside of another company and observe the leadership style and how you deal with underperformance and hiring and onboarding and just the, the, the way that the values show up or don't show up in communication among team members or during meetings and things like that. So it's been, I mean, I've gotten a lot out of, you know, my time with Lead Simple and the leadership team and, and everyone who works there. You know, I'm not going to sit here and talk about how great it is all day. That'd be kind of boring content, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's a great company. I'll say that. Um, as part of Masterminds, folks will do like a CEO swap where they'll go to each other's companies for a couple days mm -hmm. and and either observe, you know, or or even like take over for the CEO for a couple days. It feels a lot like an extended version of that. Mm. Um and it's in some ways it it it's comforting to know that the problems that we have at our company mm -hmm. are not unique and that <laughs> every company struggles with different things. Um so, you know, from that perspective it's been interesting. I don't know what do you think Wolf so, you know, I have my bachelor's and my master's. I started a, a doctoral program and decided, yeah, forget it. I will have to say that by far, this experience has probably been one of the most rewarding and probably the most educational experience to really see somebody else's company in action and seeing the wins, the the losses, the we kick butt, this, no, we got a course correct. And seeing that has been probably one of the best educational experiences somebody could have and definitely will always be thankful for that. I, I can look at some of the things I do with our, our remote team members and they are direct reflection on what I've seen at Lead Simple because I actually, I think Lead Simple now is more international than domestic as far as talent and seeing yeah. how how do you build culture with people all over the world how do you communicate how do you work how do we troubleshoot seeing that has been very helpful because the reality is not just in property management but in all industries your talent pool is now global when you hire even a small company you're going to hire globally now and i think that's when you if you were to really stop and think about it, it's kind of a frightening prospect that my next employee is probably in another country somewhere that may not even have great relations with my country, but they're the talent I need. How the heck do I make them feel like part of the team? Mm. How do we work together? Mm. They're on the opposite end of the globe. And so being able to see that has been huge. Uh, picking back off of what Peter said, seeing, oh, I'm not the only company that's gone through that or, well, I thought we were the only ones that screwed up. Like not that, not that there's a ton of problems <laughs> no, no, or no, anything. Definitely it's not. But <laughs> seeing the, the real and the raw, I think is helpful. If if people listening to this or watching this episode, if they have an opportunity to interject themselves in somebody else's company and kind of, because we're more than just shadows in there. It's not just observation. We're asked for input. But if you get that opportunity jump on it immediately well and it seems to me like there's no reason there couldn't be more of this happening just Maybe among our peers could be a way to do that yeah like there's no reason you know if if we hadn't if we're not already busy with other stuff you yeah. and i could do this for each other's company right yeah. i could be in your slack you could be in my yeah. slack and um mm. I, I i you know slack kind of makes this possible in yes. a way that it really wasn't oh, even totally. five yeah. or eight years yeah. ago because 
I mean, what are you going to ask to be on all the email threads? Like it's just, it's just not, you know, unless you're physically in the office. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting to observe like, um, lead simple. Like when I think of lead simple, I think of the slack. Like, it seems to me that that's where most of the work and communication oh, happens yeah. mm -hmm. by I, far. I really send emails to my staff. Yeah. I, I never get the sense like there's some other place that I'm not part of because mm -hmm. there's not a central office doesn't seem like there's a lot of emails going around so it's a it's a different world hmm. when you said that thing about um having a subset of team members that are global it's reminding me that i still feel somewhat of a disconnect in the way that it's discussed here i i find that in the industry rtms <laughs> global whatever it still is discussed as this like very distinct opinionated sort of thing whereas in our little company it's a fairly trivial just mm -hmm. like there are some technicalities like people are contractors whatever it's pretty irrelevant it's just like it's really fully integrated yeah. and that feels natural at this point and i think that's what i learned because i'm just gonna say it the conversation in our industry right now as much as people want to get warm and fuzzy about it it's because it saves money Right, it's a labor, Plain and simple. labor play. It, it saves money. So that's why we're doing it. Where what I got from Lead Simple is no, that was the best person. Access to talent. I don't care if they're in Brazil or Taiwan or South Africa. That was the best person. And that I think is a really important distinction. And that's something that we've tried to, uh, to roughly because initially it was like, yeah, I can get three for one. Why not? And so now it's. No, who is the best person literally on this earth that would like to work at my company? And they are a person, they are talented, they want to work, they want to provide for their family. Who cares where they live? Hmm. And, and truly getting out of that, well, it's just a cost savings. You know, uh, yeah, I want to give them a different title or I want to do whatever. But at the end of the day, most people are doing it because it's three to one hmm. versus I literally can hire anybody in this globe because they are the best person. I think that orientation shows up, right? Yeah. Intention always telegraphs yeah. through, and I think people feel that in their interaction. One of the things that was in my mind's eye in us working together was I'm really paranoid about becoming that vendor that is so distant from the end user that we're like in the castle writing things yeah. up on whiteboards and kind of like telling our customers what they need. I'm paranoid about that because I want the company to be really successful. And as the company is more successful, the easier that will be to happen. The more people that will be in the organization that are new, that don't have the contacts, that haven't talked to people, that are mildly inconvenienced by the idea of having to get on the phone with customers, et cetera. You guys interact with a lot of vendors. You're seeing the vendor landscape changing. Mm -hmm. More money is coming in. More vendors are popping up. I feel good about it. I think it's net positive. Yeah. I think it's the free market at work, and it's exciting to me. What observations do you guys have on kind of the the burgeoning prop tech ecosystem and what it means for the end user? Well, I think what by bringing us on in the capacity that we're in, some vendors I think have caught on to that. Obviously, this is now going to make that public, and I, I think it's going to change the industry. And I think more vendors are going to try to to replicate that because it is it's very beneficial to a vendor to, and it's not that we are. Hey, did you hear about such and such? You got to do this feature. It's just like you ask us, Hey, what about this feature? Oh, this one, no. <laughs> you tell don't, us. don't do that. You this tell sucks. Us when... <laughs> well, yeah. both, yeah, both Wolf and I are pretty, uh, we're not afraid to Direct. say what we think about <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's going to be beneficial and it, it really, it's going to be extremely positive for the industry as a whole because. You've heard it, right? Software designers build a software without the end user, and then the end user gets it. And like, well, what is this? So now having people that are daily using this, providing honest feedback, and that is going to help our industry because it's now actually tools. It's software that is purposely built for our industry, and it's going to allow smaller companies to compete with Wall Street. Mm. You know, to think about... What I can do with Lead Simple, 10 years ago, only Wall Street could develop software that could do that. We're now or Ben's only, 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, now I, I can compete with a uh, 10,000 door company software wise, maybe not on other areas, but I can have the same, same thing. And so those large companies, I think they're the ones that should be worried because that was their moat was their tech. Well, that's now been liberated. You know, it's kind of like the old saying about like even the richest person in the world still has an iPhone. It's like the same phone yeah. that everyone has. It's, yep. it's mm. the best, right? Yeah. More money isn't going to get you anything better. Um, my, well, getting back to what you were saying, Jordan, nothing bad ever came from staying close to your customers. Right. I mean, only positive things can happen from staying as close to your customers as possible. And I think Lead Simple is doing a great job of that. And I think for myself, I think we as a company, our own property management, need to do a better job of staying close to our older clients, mm -hmm. something that I've mm -hmm. learned. And we actually created a Slack channel and brought in like 10 of our key clients into our company Slack just in one channel. Wasn't quite as bold as you. Um, <laughs> so that we can engage with them more directly and, and run stuff by them. Um, in terms of like the vendor landscape, so my lens through which I evaluate a vendor is how seriously do they take the problem mm. of property management? Mm. And I have I I can talk to someone for ten minutes and come away with pretty strong some, yeah, yeah some understanding of they're just in it for the money. Well, I don't even mind if they're in it for the money as long as they understand how serious mm. and hard the problem is. Mm. If they minimize the problem. Mm. I mean, I immediately write them off and maybe someone will come along one day and prove me wrong. But um, my observation is that the most recent crop of vendors who, at least the ones who have been communicating with me or that I've gotten to know um, in the last maybe two years, they seem to take the problem pretty seriously. Like mm -hmm. they've observed others take a swing at it and miss. And now they're coming in with a longer runway and much more they're very interested in what the operators are struggling with, where they're winning, what problems do they have. Yes. So they're talking to customers a lot more rather than just saying, oh, we'll just fix this with software. You guys are a bunch of backwards idiots mm. who, you know, don't even know how to code, right? Yeah. Um, they're, they're coming in with some some humility and some, uh, some willingness to, to stick around and actually work on the problem for a while. So I'm really excited to see where that where that goes and where that takes the industry. That actually seems like a great adjacency for talking about the subset of vendor managers, I guess that sit somewhere in between the, the, the hybrids, the service tech hybrids that are hiring developers to attack some of these problems. Mm -hmm. The comment that you made around that you're able to compete with Wall Street, I both feel that deeply because I've seen what you've built firsthand. And I also I also make up that some folks think that that's not true. Like, how can that be true that so-and-so has hired 100 developers? And you can imagine what the cost on that is and that somehow they're competing with you. Um, it, it's it's kind of odd to me. It's a little surreal to see some of the very large, substantial development teams that have been hired and have not been able to reach parity with what technical people are able to do with off-the-shelf software, no-code, yeah. low-code, et cetera. What do you guys make up it, about yeah, that? It's not a tech problem. Say more. It's not. That's The problem is not technology. The problem in property management, I mean, you've talked about this, Jordan. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, you said tech is drown, downstream of processes and processes are downstream of policy. Yep. <clears throat> and the problem in our industry is twofold. One, policy is on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. It's not even state by state. It's city, county, state, federal. So that's the first issue. The other problem is that we as an industry haven't standardized around things that we could standardize across states and across jurisdictions. So this is not a technical problem. This is a or it's not a technology problem. It is a people policy uh, standardization problem. And I, I believe until that gets solved, we're going to sort of have a ceiling on how far we can go with technology. And we may actually be closer than a lot of people think to that ceiling already. Yeah, I mean, it's not like somebody with a fleet of developers can come out and say, you know what, if we just rounded the corners on those form fields, that would fix the industry. Like, that's all they could do. 
you know, I take what I can build and developers, all they can do is refine the code, but that's not, that's not the issue because they need to know how it works. So in the San Francisco Bay area, right, there's seven counties. Each county has its own set of rules within those counties. Different cities have their rules. Hmm. You're not going to know that just because you know, Python, Hmm. right? And so you, that's what we bring is that understanding how to navigate it, how to make it work. The tech part, yeah, it's it's easy. And so, yeah, it's not a, it's not a technology problem. It's basically what we need to do is realize that real estate's a regional product, always will be. There are definitions, I think, that we can firm up as an industry. Like our, I'm, I've kind of organically put together this maintenance mastermind and we're First thing is terminology. What is a work order to you? What is a turn? Are there different types of turns? So we're defining those terms. Now that we've defined them, now we can build a process around them. Because if I, if we just say, you know what, let's let's design the gold standard work order process, and we start doing it, we're going to have conflict because a work order means something to you that it doesn't mean to me, and that's why we can't gel on what is the process. But if I say, hey, we're developing a process around replacing carpet. That's a pretty universal term, so we we can define that. So the financial standards and benchmark that was done for NARPM is great. I think we all need to get on that operational side and define what are the terms, what are the core processes that everybody's doing, and once we have that, things can go. But you, these VC companies with all their 100, 200 programmers, they're just going to sit and spin their wheels and waste a lot of money because that's not the problem. They're chasing the wrong rabbit. Be sure to send this podcast on. To, to that. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Guys, uh, let's end it there. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for just, yeah, yeah working yeah, together. Absolutely. Jordan. Thank you. Love working with you guys. And I'm wishing you guys a lot of success with Crane. I think it's going to be big. Thank, Thank you. Jordan. Until next time. Peace. That's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. You can check out other episodes along the way. If you're watching this on YouTube, appreciate to subscribe. Any comments, I'm always here to engage. If you're listening on an audio platform, we'd really appreciate a review. It's a great way to help other people find out about the show.